starting to dry out is and start to spike is make sure that you're spraying your cocktail. You know, we, we get it on there all the time. Uh, we've got a lot of new members in the group that, that aren't, you know, quite so, um, you know, uh, vigilant about doing it. There's nothing worse than growing your vandas all year long just to have thrips come in and chew your flower spikes off. That's a real bummer. So take the time. This is the time to do that. Another great thing to do is this is the time of the year to use some higher phosphorus type plants, for which they call blossom boosters. What happens is, is these shorter days that we're getting, coupled with these cooler nights and warmer days, that's two little um, triggers for the plant to go ahead and flower. Then you hit it with high phosphorus, the plant just basically goes berserk and starts popping out flower spikes everywhere. That's a good sign that you're growing well. This is a time to use that type of food. Don't use it too often. But instead of, you know, we're doing uh, three times a week with the, uh, uh, a month with the grow and once with the, with the bloom, substitute one, do two and two. And you can do that through probably January. You know, two weeks of, of bloom, two weeks of grow. Two weeks of bloom, two weeks of grow. Yay! That's making sure that you're going to get good quality flowers on your spikes. If you use too much nitrogen at this time of the year, you're going to get really puny, weak-looking flowers that, that get really long spikes on them, but they've got a lot of spaces in it. Nitrogen tends to make things expand a little bit too much. Great for growing in the summertime, but it's very poor for flower quality in the wintertime, all right? The next question everybody asks is about, you know, what, what is really too cold for a vanda? In these buildings here, I keep it at 60 degrees, but that's because I'm greenhouse growing, which is not easier than outside growing, trust me, but these plants would get really mad at me if they got cold. Once they've been out at your house for a month, you know, a couple weeks, they start to get used to being outside, you know, with, a, with Mother Nature's temperatures taking care of it. I'm controlling everything about these plants' lives in here right now, they like me, they're gonna like you even better, and you'll get more flowers out of them too because of your, your you know, triggers, the stresses on the plant, which is what the cool weather is. For you guys, if you wanna really start to get concerned about it, should be when we get down into the 40s. Um, you know, you're not gonna kill your Vanda if it gets into the 40s, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna slow down. And uh, Vandas don't really have a rest period, but they can go semi-dormant. And cooling them off is the quickest way to get them to go semi-dormant. You'll notice all your root tips retreat, the plant stops growing, that's because it got a little bit too cold. If it gets really, really cold on it, the plant's gonna probably just shut off entirely and won't pick up growth until the springtime again, which is you know not what we're trying to do. So if it gets a little too cold, starts to get down in the 40s, that's when you wanna think about either bringing them in or wrapping them up. That's another great thing to do. Don't wrap them with plastic. Wrap them with either burlap or get some old sheets at Goodwill. Um, you know, get something that man. you can't here at the party today. All right, another very important thing too is, is that at this time of the year, the weather, you know, the weather's drying out. We're not in the rainy season anymore. We're in the dry season. You want to make sure that you're correctly watering your vandas because nothing's going to dehydrate them faster than a nice, sunny, warm day with low humidity. That's a recipe for disaster for dehydrating vandas. And especially if you've got a lot of flowers on your plants, a lot of people don't realize the, the flowers are actually like water pumps. They're, all they're doing is pulling moisture out of the root system of the plant, and you can actually get a plant fold up and dehydrate from a big head of flowers on there. So you wanna make sure that you're being diligent, you're watering every day. If it's a really cold day, you can skip it. But when, you know, we get in the, you know, the low 70s, that's still a great day to go ahead and water. You just wanna make sure that you're doing it early enough so that the plants dry out by nightfall. Um, because cool and damp is also going to get you rot, it's gonna get you crown rot, gonna get you black rot, um, you know, things like that that you wanna avoid. But spraying your cocktail, spraying the, you know, the insecticides and the fungicides is gonna to help to prevent that type of stuff from happening. And another chemical that we like to use a lot at this time of the year is Fizan, which is a, um, it's a quaternary ammonium uh, disinfectant, basically. It has no residual action on the plant. The plants nor the fungus can develop a resistance to it because it's an oxidizer. But as soon as it dries, it's done working. But that's a great thing to use at this time of the year. If you want to do that once or twice a month, just avoid the flowers because the stuff will burn the flowers on the plant when you use it at the rate that you're supposed to, which is about two teaspoons a gallon. Um, that's going to help clean your roots off gonna help clean the plant up. If we get rainy weather, it's a great opportunity to go out there and squirt it down with Fizan, because that's really the only thing that's gonna work when the plant is, uh, is wet, is um, the chemicals that are like that, that are oxidizing. Um, does anybody have any questions? Epsom salt, that's a, that's a great point. Sometimes you'll notice that if your plants got a little too cold, that they'll get like a reddish hue to them on the top of the leaves, either reddish or purple, just depending on the variety of plant that is. What that is, is that's a, the plant is showing you a symptom of a magnesium deficiency. Uh, and the easiest way that you can get magnesium to go into your plant is via Epsom salts, the same stuff you soak in the bathtub with. That's a, also a plant food. It's got magnesium and sulfur in it. Right before the weather likes to get cold, I like to use Epsom salt in here 
just to prevent that purpling from happening. Even though, you know, if we're fertilizing on a regular basis, you still are going to be lacking a little bit of magnesium uh, in the plant unless you're using things like cow mag, which I, do, which I don't like to use. I'd rather just use straight up Epsom salts. Uh, so I'm not giving the plants all that nitrogen at this time of the year. That doesn't mean you're not going to get the purpling of the leaves. That just means it's going to be a lot less and then it's going to be easier for the plant to get rid of it once the weather warms up. Because as long as it's not too bad, it will go away in the springtime once the weather warms up. But that's your first little and that's your first little visual cue that your plant has gotten a little bit too cold. And it can happen overnight. Uh, and that's from magnesium deficiency. And I'm sure many of you guys that are growing outside are going to see that. And this, this should go without saying. If it gets really cold out and windy, you want to bring your plants in. And if we start getting, we don't get too often where we get into the low 40s out here, but it does happen. That's the danger zone for the plants to start to um, uh, begin to get frost damage on them. Uh, you'll go out in the morning and you'll see like your leaves are, have got like these white, almost like runny splotches on them. That's the plant that just froze. They, the same thing that happens when it burns. It just happens, yeah, it's like freezer burn for the plant. And that starts to happen around in the, you know, in the low 40s to upper 30s. You get too colder than that and obviously you're gonna freeze the plant. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we don't do that. There's certain types of plants that like it a little bit cooler. The Ascocendus tend to love the cool weather. Um, Rhinocostylus like the cool weather. That This is a time of the year that they start to flower and the Rhinocostylus are those big fat leaf ones that we have in there that are gonna get big, long, cascading, very fragrant. Um, pe uh, you know, pendulous blooms. They call them the foxtail or That orchid actually likes it a little bit cooler. It's not unhappy at all if it's in the 50s. You know, the, the plant actually needs that to get it to go ahead and flower. So don't be afraid of letting the cool touch the plant. You know, um, your, your most important and most dangerous time is going to be when you start to get into the 40s for growing outside. But you guys have done a great job all summer long, all spring and summer. It's so exciting for me to see all these new faces here and get all these new members that's in the group. You know, a lot of people will charge you to go to their nursery and uh and listen to the class and listen to them talk and you know this is all about guys teaching you how to grow vandas i had no professional experience whatsoever in growing these plants and in you know 20 years it's been a long time i've been growing but we're the top dog right now and that's because i do exactly what it is that i tell you guys to do there's no real secrets here that's going on everybody here is learning the same things that i taught myself how to do so if you use them you're going to have the same type of results that i do and it makes me so proud to see you guys on the um on Bandamaniacs and on Florida Orchid Growers showing all your beautiful flowers and you know everybody here this is just such a, a really cool group and you know that's what I'm very thankful for this year is for all of y'all's support you've been with me through some tough times nobody's you know th this is a great group and I really do appreciate you very much not just as a customer but as a friend you know what I mean if you're here you're my friend and thank you for coming to Friendsgiving all right thank you very much does anybody have any questions go ahead Shelby go ahead That's fine, yeah. If, if they've gotten good and wet and it takes them a while to dry out, then okay. that's not a bad thing. That's so, not a bad thing. So now, when it's quiet out like this, mm -hmm. do I water every day? Every, you, every yes, no, you want to water every day in the wintertime. As long as it's a nice, sunny day. If it's, over, if it's overcast, let it go. I mean, I go, I think this week I didn't water two days, uh, but I watered every other day. And I'll, you know, if, it's, if it stays cloudy and it's cool out, I won't water for a week if they don't need it. You know, but keeping them dry during cool and overcast weather, and, and cool, damp, no, and overcast good. weather is the, the best thing that you can do to keep the fungus off them, is to keep them dry. Obviously, if they're outside, you're not gonna be able to do that, but what are we gonna use? Fizan. It's a great thing to use when your plants are wet. Is it, well, Fizan is, is two teaspoons a gallon, and everybody, I'm sure most of you guys have yeah, got that sprayer. ortho dial top sprayer by now. Just pour the stuff in there, set your dial top to two teaspoons, and spray them away. It should be nice and foamy. At that point, you wanna really, really, you know, flush the plant out, flush out the leaf axles, really get those roots nice and nice and wet. Because if you if it doesn't touch it, if the water doesn't touch it, it's not going to do what it's supposed to do. And you know, when we got these plants with these big giant root systems on them, they have to get really wet to get those internal roots wet. So you want to make sure that you're, but not yeah, but not on the blooms. You know, if you do get some on the blooms, that dial top sprayer has an off setting. Just turn it off and squirt your flowers off. Um, what I used to do in here, I don't use. Um, much fizz in anymore. I'm using something that I can use every day on the plant, and it's not. It's called um, sanidates. Same type of chemistry, just a little bit of a different chemical. Um, what I used to do was wait until I see the foam coming out of the middle of the plant and falling on the ground. When you've done that, then you know you've gotten the, the core, the, cent the center of your root system, good and wet. 
And that's important for Vandas, not just with, with Fizan, but with watering and with fertilizing. Do the two-step method. The two-step method is great when you're using a hose. You give it once, you wait a couple minutes, you give it again. That's going to make sure that the plant has an opportunity to really get primed up and get ready to soak the, um, the chemical up that you're putting on it. Um, never fertilize on dry root or on wet roots. You're going to hear a lot of, of um, conflicting stories on that. It, you got to think about it like this. If you have a kitchen sponge and the sponge is full of water, it's not going to soak up any more water, is it? That's the same thing with the roots. If you want it to suck up what you're giving, you got to be dry. Because if you do it when it's wet, it's just going to roll right off of the plant. So it's important that you water the plant, or that you um, fertilize, and also do your chemicals when the plants have got dry roots on them. That's a, you know, a very, very important thing to do. And how much Epsom salt? Epsom salt, you can use a tablespoon a gallon. And it, it, it wouldn't kill the plant if you did it once a week. You know, the plant would actually get nice and green and grow well. I don't do it, but it, you know, if you have the ability to do it, by all means, go for it. It's on. The, it's it's basically the, you know a combination of insecticides and fungicides, but it's on our um, on Vandamaniacs. It's up at the top under the facts section. Uh, Jason Dole took the time to go ahead and write all that stuff up. And for the northern people, the um, uh, Michael Wiley has written one just for you guys um, to be able to have uh, you know basically the idea of what it is that we're doing down here. Even though I wouldn't necessarily want to spray orthene inside my house in the winter time, it'll give you all the recipes for the um, for the fertilizers and things like that. There is a million different kinds of fertilizers that's out there on the market. The best stuff that you guys can buy is Dynagro. I don't care what anybody says, it's Dynagro. That company has done a ton of research and development to make that product exactly what it's supposed to be, which is a super plant food. We never use kelp, we never use seaweed here. The only extra hormone solution I'm using is Super Thrive, and I use it very sparingly, and I use it in the summertime. That's the only time that I use that. These vandas that are grown in here are grown by good culture. That's basically what's doing it. Regular old fertilizer, regular old water, um, and you know, being diligent on the, the use of the chemicals, using them when you need them. You know? Go ahead, Matt. Timothy wanted to know if you can use Epsom salt with um, fertilizer also. Timothy, who last him? Timothy Laskin's supposed to be at a birthday party. <laughs> no, use the Epsom salts by itself. And also, never mix Fizan with fertilizer. If you mix Fizan with fertilizer, it turns into a big, greasy mess. We'll see you in the hospital then. Yeah, exactly. Anybody got any more questions? I did. Go ahead, Randy. You know the downfall, you know, the, I call them waterfalls. Like the, when do the leaves come off for the new... They, they usually start falling off in December. Okay. Uh, that's a that's a time. And that's another great question. Anybody here that's growing those dendrobium superbums, there's a big myth that you need to dry those things out hard to get them to flower. And I did that for years, and I had the wimpiest blooms ever, and I almost killed the plants. A couple of years back, I just started leaving them right in the same uh, water. I just right. bump them up into a little bit more light, and lo and behold, I'd lose three-quarters of the leaves on the stem on each, uh, on each cane, and they would bloom from the top to the bottom. And I said, Eureka, yet another thing that's an old wives' tale that you hear out there from people that are following what other people have told them versus right. doing, you know, experimenting with things like that. If you don't experiment, you're never going to learn anything new. You know what I mean? So don't be you afraid to do it. But that plant should bloom generally. It's at the end of February, okay. just depending on what the uh, what so the weather. I'm losing a few leaves right that's, now. That's totally normal. Okay. That's totally normal. You know, I, I would those. still continue to to. Um, to water them normally, oh, I you know what I mean? Them. Do exactly what you've been doing. Thank you. And I found that I, I have, a, I got a wall of those things over there. I get a wall full of flowers, and it's very pretty. That's my favorite place to I mean, sit at the end of February. The weather's beautiful. It smells so good. I'm good over there. Just a, just a chill place I'm to be, you know what I mean? Go ahead. Yeah, the catacetums, I don't know too much about those things, honestly. I mean, I think they're very, very pretty, but... Yeah, yeah. Right. Gives you a of flowers. Uh, yeah, there may be there may be something to that. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Yes. Is that right? I mean, I think that that's how you grow them, but. I got a question. What, Jason? Everybody getting blasted butts. Blasted buds is generally at this time of the year is from the, um, the uh, temperature swing a lot. You know, if we get a, a you know 90 degree day like we had last week, and all of a sudden a cold front comes through and it's you know 50 degrees at night, that's a little bit too much of a temperature swing, and that's a, a recipe for for blasting flowers. Heat is another thing that causes those buds to blast, and also a lot of water and uh, overcast conditions. If they stay wet too long, they won't necessarily blast, but they'll rot. 
uh, on the flower. So blast means that they, you'll have some flowers that, that open and then the rest of the spike dies off. That's called bud blast is the, is the term for that. Go ahead, Jason. We kill our fruits with the cocktail. Yes. Where do the other fruits come from? The babies? Do they lay eggs or something? Thrips lay, thrips lay eggs, that's right. Yep. But the, uh, the good thing is their life cycle is relatively short. So with the systemic action of orthine, which is about 14 days, um, the um, second generation has had a chance to come up and, and uh, suck the, on the juices of the, of the flower. And die! That's right. Oh, the flower will die. No, no, no. You do that about every six weeks or as needed. If you start to see the damage, which now you're going to start to see it because the weather is still relatively warm and it's very dry out. You know, when it stops raining, when it's raining out there, the, the, the thrips that we have are very, very tiny. They get washed off and they got plenty of lush stuff out in the landscape to eat on. But, it, you know, once it starts drying out, they look at your van and they're like, wow, look at all that juice and, you know, succulent roots and everything. I'm going to come in here and, you know, we just had this breast where there's a little bit of... Uh, Orthene odor over there in the other uh, in the other building, but it has to be done, you know. That's Wiley's favorite smell. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. You know the thing about neem oil is neem, neem oil is something that's going to smother the bug. But I, I tell you what, the problem with using oil-based stuff on vandas is that vandas have stomata on their leaf, which are like little mouths that open and close that control their respiration. If you put an oil on the plant, you're going to coat that um, stomata, and you're going to you know, basically repel what it is that you're trying to put into there, you know? Um, the oil is not, I mean, it, it can be used, uh, but you just gotta watch it. You don't put it on when it's hot out, and that you, you know, water it heavily when you are watering it to wash that stuff off, you know? That's like an organic t uh, type of thing. I don't, the only thing that I use in here that's organic is the, um, the sanidate, which is basically, it's a peroxide and vinegar mixture that um, I put in my lines every day to help try to keep the plants clean, try to kill any, fu any fungus that likes to grow. I can use it every day at a really low dose. When do the leaves come off for the new flowers? They, they usually start falling off in December. Okay. Uh, that's, a, that's a time, and that's another great question. Anybody here that's growing those dendrobium superbums, there's a big myth that you need to dry those things out hard to get them to flower. And I did that for years, and I had the wimpiest blooms ever, and I almost killed the plants. A couple years back, I just started leaving them right in the same uh, water. I just right. bump them up into a little bit more light, Lo and behold, I'd lose three quarters of the leaves on the stem on each uh, on each cane, and they would bloom from the top to the bottom. And I said, Eureka, yet another thing that's an old wives' tale that you hear out there from people that are following what other people have told them versus right. doing, you know, experimenting with things like that. If you don't experiment, you're never going to learn anything new. You know what I mean? So don't be afraid to do it. But that plant should bloom generally. It's at the end of February, okay. just depending on what the uh, what so the weather. I'm doing. losing a few leaves right that's, now. That's totally normal. Okay. That's totally normal. You know, I would still continue to, to, um, to water them normally, oh, I I you know what I mean, do exactly what you've been doing. Thank you. And I found that I, I have, a, I got a wall of those things over there. I get a wall full of flowers, and it's very pretty. That's my favorite place to sit at the end of February. The weather's beautiful. It smells so doggone good over there. Just a, just a chill place awesome. to be, you know what I mean? Go ahead. Uh, the, yeah, the catacetums, I don't know too much about those things, honestly. I mean, I think they're very, very pretty, but... Yeah, yeah. Right. Gives you a of flowers. Nah. Yeah, there may be there may be something to that. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Is that right? I mean, I that that's how you grow them, but. I got a question. What, Jason? Everybody gets blasted buds. What causes this? Blasted buds is generally at this time of the year is from the, um, the uh, temperature swing a lot. You know, if we get a, a you know 90 degree day like we had last week, and all of a sudden a cold front comes through and it's you know 50 degrees at night, that's a little bit too much of a temperature swing, and that's a, a recipe for for blasting flowers. Heat is another thing that causes those buds to blast, and also a lot of water and uh, overcast conditions. If they stay wet too long, they won't necessarily blast, but they'll rot uh, on the flower. So. Blast means that they, you'll have some flowers that, that open and then the rest of the spike dies off. That's called bud blast is the, is the term for that. Go ahead, Jason. Um, when we kill our fruits with the cocktail. Yes. Where do the other fruits come from? The babies? Do they lay eggs or something? Thrips lay, thrips lay eggs, that's right. Yep. But the, uh, the good thing is their life cycle is relatively short. So with the systemic action of orthine, which is about 14 days, um, the um, second generation has had a chance to come up and, and uh, suck the, on the juices of the, of the flower. 
and die. That's right. Oh, the flower will die. No, no, no. You do that about every six weeks or as needed. If you start to see the damage, which now you're going to start to see it because the weather is still relatively warm and it's very dry out. You know, when it stops raining, when it's raining out there, the, the, the thrips that we have are very, very tiny. They get washed off and they got plenty of lush stuff out in the landscape to eat on. But, it, you know, once it starts drying out, they look at your van and they're like, wow, look at all that juice and, you know, succulent roots and everything. I'm going to come in here and, you know, we just had to spray us where there's a little bit of uh, Orthene odor over there in the other uh, in the other building, but it has to be done, you know. That's Wiley's favorite smell. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. You know the thing about neem oil is neem, neem oil is something that's going to smother the bug. But I, I tell you what, the problem with using oil-based stuff on vandas is that vandas have stomata on their leaf, which are like little mouths that open and close that control their respiration. If you put an oil on the plant, you're going to coat that um, stomata, and you're going to you know basically repel what it is that you're trying to put into there, you know? Um, the oil is not, I mean, it, it can be used, uh, but you just gotta watch it. You don't put it on when it's hot out, and that you, you know, water it heavily when you are watering it to wash that stuff off, you know? That's like an organic t uh, type of thing. I don't, the only thing that I use in here that's organic is the, um, the sanidate, which is basically, it's a peroxide and vinegar mixture that um, I put in my lines every day to help try to keep the plants clean, try to kill any, fu any fungus that likes to grow. I can use it every day at a really low dose. It smells just like salad dressing, really super strong. Uh, you know what I mean? But, um, yeah. Do we have any more questions from uh, people on Facebook? I got one for you. When should we use cinnamon? Never. It's on, that, it's on the cake yeah. over there. What's that? Um, systemic resistance. Bring it up. Yep. Fungus, bugs, um, outside of what you guys talk about using in the cocktail have you experimented with any other forms of uh... yeah i use i use heritage and i use like a flagship i use a couple of different um products but what, what i found is that those, first of all those are really expensive chemicals most people aren't doing it as regular as they should be anyways right. and the stuff that we're using has got a relatively low um, time frame of its systemic activity right. so if you're going two or three months with using it you don't have to really worry about the resistance it's when you're using the same stuff all the time that you can get uh well, how close is too close I'd say like eight weeks is probably too close. You know, if you if you let it go two months, you're not going to have a problem. But you know, some people are out there doing you know once every three or four weeks in some nurseries, and that's where the problem really comes in is from other nurserymen that are using it too often. You know what I mean? It's better it's better to let the um, the bugs eat your plant and let them uh, live through a life cycle and get it out and then nuke them. You know, as a matter of fact, right now in the, um, our last spray will be in December, and then I probably won't spray again until like March. I'm letting all the chemicals. Good job. I'm letting all the chemical get out of the, the plant system and get out of the bug system because once it starts to get really cool, the bugs and the fungus are going to start to slow down. Uh, the bugs especially, you'll get a different types of funguses that come on when the weather is cool, but the bugs are going to slow down pretty much, so I won't spray until I start to see the first signs of damage uh, in the springtime, and then I'll nuke everything. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, somebody wanted to know what's the salad dressing made to vinegar and <laughs> That's the, the one I use is called Sanidate, but the one that a lot of people on here use is called Xeritol. And Xeritol is um, peroxyacetic acid is the name of the, the formula. It's OMRI listed, which is the organic whatever registry. Um, you can use it every day. It's not going to harm the environment. All that that breaks down into is just basically um, um, hydrogen and, and uh, oxygen as it breaks down water and, and uh, oxygen as the uh, peroxide is doing it. What the vinegar does in that is it stabilizes the peroxide. If you get a cut on your hand or whatever and you put peroxide, you see how it bubbles up, but then all of a sudden it stops bubbling. If you were to put this stuff on your hand, it burn a hole through you. But uh, it would stay active until the actual chemical dries up. So the, the vinegar stabilizes the peroxide. I would highly recommend against trying to mix that stuff yourself because it can be explosive if you don't know what you're doing. So don't think you're going to outsmart uh, biosafe systems and try to make it yourself because you might just get a nasty chemical burn in your face. And in your lungs. Go ahead. Sure. No, no, Fizan actually, if you read the orchid label of Fizan, they recommend that growers either use a foot bath before going in propagation, or if you're a smoker, that you wash your hands with it at a tablespoon a gallon to kill the cymbidium mosaic virus that's on, or the tobacco mosaic virus that's on your hands. That's on your know, tobacco. So they actually recommend washing your hands with it. It's, it's the same type of stuff that they use in hospitals to disinfect their, their instruments and stuff like that. It's just labeled for plant use uh, also. We got any more online on uh, Facebook? Yeah, but she's young. She's young. That's we are. 
It's on our, on, are you in Vandamaniacs in our group? Yeah, you should uh, just join it. And there's a few chemicals that are on there. Join Vandamaniacs. Yeah, all one word. And then... Uh,